All right, so hypodescent, the one drop rule. I mentioned this earlier. Um, who can kind of tell me what they think the one drop rule is? I don't know. Okay. You have one drop of um, black blood in your blood. That's right. And one drop of black blood in quotations um, makes you black, um, which again is a legal fiction, right? Because there's no such thing as one drop of black blood. But this um, concept, again, got written into legal decisions. Um, public policy was made around it. Um, so uh, essentially, it's that any racial mixture um, equals impurity. Um, impurity from being white. And non-white persons were then subordinates because they were racially inferior under the one drop rule. So this is a depiction of a white woman named Alice Jones Rhinelander. And it was around, I think, the 1920s, 1930s. And she was the daughter of English immigrants. She married a wealthy husband. And the family was upset because they're like, she's poor, we're rich, we want them to get an annulment. Boy, what's one of the easiest ways to do that? Claim that she's black somewhere back in her ancestry, her great-great-grandmother was probably black. And so this was actually a very common way um, for people to be discredited. Um, there's a concept and a whole genre of books from the Harlem Renaissance on passing. People, light-skinned people of color passing as white um, because, and if they were outed, you know, they would, you know, devastating things would happen to them. This was all due, you know, a lot to this, um, concept of the one drop rule, that you can never breed out of being racially inferior. Um, so her attorney had her address in court <laughs> to prove that she was not a black woman anywhere on her body, and she won the case. So this is just an ex one of you know thousands of examples that happened throughout history of the um, how crazy it is that you know people would look at other people as inferior just because of um, potentially being of a black ancestry. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of the case of Loving versus Virginia, right? 1967, okay, and this was actually a um, HBO documentary that came out, I think, last, uh, last year, and it was excellent. And it depicted the relationship of Mr. and Mrs. Loving, which, um, who were a uh, black and a Native American woman and a, a white man who um, got married and um, were arrested um, in their home while they were sleeping, pulled out of bed for violating the um, interracial, a ban against interracial marriage in the South in some southern states. So still in 1967, um, 16 states still um, outlawed, you know, people of different races marrying. So this is an ancient history. So our policies today um, are built on our policies of yesterday. And it's taken people's awareness and struggles to say, wait a minute, this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and then there was this case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, if you um, the top picture is um, all white Supreme Court justices. Um, some have been passed um, ties to slave owning. And the picture below is um, this uh, man here. What, what race might you guess that he is? I mean, just by looking at him, what might he look like? He looks German. Okay, so, so German or white. And he's actually, this is... Um, Mr. Plessy, he was seven eighths white and one eighth black. And he was asserting that he was more white than black. And even under the one drop rule, you can see that I'm more white than I am black. And therefore, I should be able to be given the racial advantages that come with whiteness. Um, he was denied the right to sit in a first first class railroad car, and the NAACP took up his fight and fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. So 
Plessy versus Ferguson is often known for anyone here of Separate But Equal? I'm sure everyone's heard of Separate But Equal. Probably don't relate it to Plessy necessarily. Um, so people think it stands for uh, Separate But Equal. Um, but in fact, that was already decided in a case called Roberts versus Boston uh, in 1850, so years earlier. Um, what Plessy versus Ferguson actually stands for is whiteness as a property right. Uh, and I've gone in and read the case, and you can actually read it online yourself. And the justices do say that there is a legal advantage to being white, that whiteness is uh, a, a concept that um, uh, is a legal status, and if it's damaged, um, the white people could sue for um, damages or for money. And so Plessy made this um, argument, how much would it be, uh, I'm sorry, Plessy's lawyer, black NAACP lawyer, made this case an argument in 1896. How much would it be worth for a young man entering upon the practice of law to be regarded as a white man rather than a colored one. Six-sevenths of the population are white. Nineteen-twentieths of the property of the country is owned by white people. Ninety-nine-hundredths of the business opportunities are in control of white people. Probably, most white persons, if given a choice, would prefer death to life in the United States as colored persons. Under these conditions, is it possible to conclude that the reputation of being white is property? Indeed, is it not the most valuable sort of property being the master key that unlocks the golden door for opportunity? So, what do you think? Do you think the United States Supreme Court at that time agreed with him this argument that whiteness was property. And did he win? Probably. So probably which one? Probably the Supreme Court did not. Did not let him win. Okay. So probably did not let him win. Did not call it property. Okay, did not call it property, did not let him win. And this is kind of a trick question because the Supreme Court agreed with him and ruled against him. Because he, they basically said, you're right. If he be a, a white man, he being Plessy, if he be a white man and assigned to a colored coach on the railroad, he may have his action for damages against the company for being deprived of his so-called property of whiteness. Upon the other hand, if he be a colored man and so be assigned, he has been deprived of no property since he is not lawfully entitled to the reputation of being a white man. So the law right there in this case said that whiteness is real, it's valuable, he can't get it because he's not white, right? Because of his eighth. Because of his eighth, right, right, which would fall under the wooden drop rule, <laughs> right. And Plessy remained the law of the land until which case? In 1954, nearly 60 years later. Hmm? Oh, wow. <laughs> Which case? You all know it. Rosa Parks. Brown. She had to do, who said Brown? Exactly. So Brown versus the board actually overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. So it's a reason why we had um, the law supporting segregation. It wasn't just through our practices in good old boys town. It was the law of the land, north and south, that said, because of racial inferiority, we have segregation of people all the way to 1954. So again, not that long ago, right? So when people think that we are so far removed from these concepts, we can see even today, just using the Hispanic categorization, we are actually not that far away from um, these legal precedents. All right, any questions, thoughts, comments? 